Hello, adventuresses! Welcome to the show for women who love horses, travel, and adventure. In today's episode, I talk to Gosha from Poland, and she shares with us some very interesting information and stories about growing up working with horses in Poland, and also the special for today. She shares with us a place. It's called the End of the World in Tierra del Fuego, Argentina. And let me tell you, you're going to listen to her story. And you're going to be just like me and be Googling when your next flight to this place is. It is a remote place. She had an encounter riding with some penguins. She has to time her rides each day based with the tide. She's also ridden with some wild horses in this area and lots and lots of interesting stories and adventures. She's also going to share with you some history and information. For example, all of the shipwrecks, which are still there to this day. And it's absolutely fascinating listening to her stories. Before we get started, I just want to make a couple of quick announcements. Firstly, our Equestrian Adventuresses documentary has officially been launched. Episode 1 of Season 1 is now available on YouTube for free. Go and watch it. Just find Equestrian Adventuresses YouTube channel, and it's a 20-minute show. It's about uh, Lesvos, an island in Greece, and about Rita, the woman who created this amazing writing program there and i learned a lot by visiting her and i hope you guys enjoy the documentary it was an absolute blast filming it in greece so please subscribe to our channel and share the video with your friends it helps make a big difference also i am currently riding my two horses across the country of ireland um it's day i think 13 it's a bit rainy outside so we also have some youtube videos available about our current adventures so go and watch the the channel it's free subscribe share it with your friends and it helps us out quite a bit and the other thing i just want to mention is for you to check out our website equestrianadventuresses.com we have some beautiful jewelry for sale it's available on our website it is in collaboration with silversteed it's a uk-based company and it's basically our logo a woman galloping around the world on horseback it's absolutely stunning so it's available on our website once again at equestrianadventuresses.com and hit it. We are explorers. We are trailblazers. We love to do what cannot be done. We love to test our limits, cross borders, and we love the freedom horses bring us. We seek lands without fences. Who are we? We are equestrian adventuresses. We are a community of women who love horses, travel, and adventure. To infinity. And beyond! And now, your host, Crystal Kelly! Hello, adventuresses! And today we are talking with Gosha, so I just wanted to say thank you, Gosha, and welcome on the show. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. <laughs> uh, I'm a little nervous, <laughs> to be honest, in the <laughs> beginning. But uh, hello, everybody. So, my name is Gosha Ostachowicz. It's actually Małgorzata Ostachowicz, but I know it's quite difficult to everybody outside of Poland <laughs> to pronounce it. I'm Polish. And, but, well, I'm 30 six years old now in the moment and living in the Warsaw uh, originally from Krakow so this is uh, the second biggest city in Poland wow okay so you have um I, I recently published an article that you sent to me and it it really really um caught my eyes and it's actually one of my favorites but before I, I get into you know that adventure that you had I just want to step back a little bit and um, start from the beginning, like how did you get into horses and then when did you start traveling with horses? Um, all right, uh, so we need to go back <laughs> quite a long time in the past. Uh, so I think I was always that kind of girl that loved the horses and wants to ride, but I think there was, there was not many tradition of horse riding in my family and my mother was not very keen to let me ride. So I need to say a big thank you to my auntie, <laughs> Auntie Barbara, if she was, if you are listening to that, thank you. <laughs> uh, so she like pushed my parents, oh, let her do it. And actually when I was 12 years old, I we signed up with my mother for some like lessons together. She was like... A uh, block of 10 lessons and my mother go with me. She said, okay, I need to see how it works <laughs> to be sure if you'll be safe. 
And so uh, my brave mother also started to write by herself. Uh, unfortunately, her health was not very strong, so she couldn't really continue with me. But that's how it all starts. And from from that time, so when I was 11, I was writing. Um, I remember that it was not a easy thing for me because I was not very good in the beginning and the horses doesn't listen didn't listen to me and <laughs> it was really difficult I remember like you know crying in the pillow that oh I'll never sit on the horse again because I'm so bad in that but anyway I have such a strong drive to to keep riding because this is definitely the passion of my life so after some years I get better and better and since I was like maybe 15 16 I was regularly like doing some um, summer jobs with the horses um there was a big there was an important place in my life which is called uh Hutsulski stable in Nilapita it is near to Krakow so this is the place when we when when we have the Hutsulski horses i don't know if you ever heard about them um i i must have which which horses are these they, they are like a uh not so dif- uh, different from the white horses from like Przewalski horse and uh, they were originally in Romania, Hungary, Slovakia, Ukraine, in, in the mountain regions. And um, the people are using them to transport things through the mountains and also to, to shepherd the sheep uh, in the mountains. So they're quite small, a uh, little higher than Mongolia horses. But, you know, I think the same <laughs> characters, little, little stubborn, I would say, but the very strong and grateful trail and very brave ones. Okay. So this is the place where my my friends were breeding them, and when I was riding for many years, I, I spent them near, there like 15 years of my life uh, together. I think when first of all like r- learning how to ride, uh, you know, going around with the horses, try to break in my first horses in my life, and then when I was older, I also started to work as an instructor in that place. So this is why it great place for me and like my second parents the owners of the of the place amazing and i have a very amazing friends from that place so when we know each other now more than 20 years and we still stay together and so <laughs> thank you also people from that place from nella pizza that you know bring us together and i have a very best friends from there so it sounds like horses <laughs> have been a big part of your life growing up in poland then <laughs> Yeah, definitely. So all my all, uh, you know, free time I spent with the horses, all my friends were traveling, they going some abroad and I was like, no, the horses, the horses <laughs> all the time. I was even, you know, so I even have my boyfriend, I think, oh, sorry, you know, I need to go for one month or something to, to work with the horses. <laughs> so yeah, actually, the horses were really uh, very often in the first place in my life. And <laughs> um, <laughs> Sometimes I wonder if this is a good choice or not, but this is how it is. The horses were were very important. And so uh, when I was uh, on the university, I was working during the summers. I started to go abroad for some work with the sport horses. I go to Denmark. It was my first encounter with, the, well, like we used to say, big horses, you know, because the Husolski horses were small. Mm. And with the warm I didn't bloods. have like... Yeah. yeah, and that was the, for the first time of my life I could ride, you know, like a proper uh, horses that, you know, they're not like a primitive horses that only go on the trials and, you know, have no idea about collection and things like that. Like imagine horses in, in Mongolia that I, any, anybody learn dressage or, or something like this to them. So that was my first encounter uh, with that kind of horses. And I, of course, would. I think that wow this was great and amazing different world completely different than we have in Poland and also for us it was it was important moment because the, the Poland joined the European Union so we may start to to travel freely without you know any visa and we may start to work legally outside of the country because before uh, before that because 2000 before 2004 it was not so easy for us for Polish people to, to travel so that also opened for me the whole world of 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 horse job so i work in denmark and the next summer i work in london and and yeah 
But when I finished my study, I, I skipped to the, be like a full-time instructor in some stable that was close to, to Krakow here, uh, doing mostly some dressers and some, you know, some beginner sliders as well. And yeah, <laughs> and then at some point I realized that it's so difficult in my country to really like, you know, live from the horses. Um, so a lot of my friends that are connected with the whole horse tourism or, or other kind of horse activities, they, they move abroad because it is really not easy to to to, to live, um, to, to earn enough money to live from the horses in Poland, you know, if you know what I mean. And, and has that improved a little bit now that um, Poland is a part of the EU or is it still, I don't know, not very easy to find horse jobs in Poland? Uh, they are, um, I think that it's more, it's easier. There's, uh, of course, much more horses than, than we have uh, when I start riding. I think in the 90s, when I was riding near to my home city, there was like, I would say maybe five, six places. And now we have like 50, 60 all in the nearby. So this is really much more and much more horses and there's also much more opportunities but it's still if you don't own your own place uh your career is rather short so you might start to work as an instructor somewhere as a groom and there's no rather any option to develop so we are not so developed like i don't know germany uk or or france if we think thinking about you know sport horses i think the tourists it's what's developing more because in the 90s what start was happening in poland so we have something that we call it uh uh this is like polish uh, tourism association so they started to have like department dedicated to horse trails and so nowadays we have really a lot more than a few thousand kilometers of market horse race in Poland. So that also developed our horse tourism. So there's also some opportunities um, to work there. And in Poland, so I've actually, I visited a couple of places in Poland, but not on horseback, uh-huh. unfortunately. And I noticed, I mean, Poland was really beautiful and the people were really like friendly and helpful. I actually, I was um, driving my little crappy car and I ran out of fuel in the middle of the night. And um, oh, wow. I was able to coast into a, like, I don't know, one of those roadside stops with just a mm-hmm. toilet or something. And there was um, a car ended up pulling up next to me and <clears throat> it only took, uh, you know, a, a short little conversation and they offered to drive me to a fuel station and they helped me fill up my car and you know, they were really, really helpful. And then they recommended like which castles I should visit while I was driving through. And um, I I noticed it's one of those like hidden gems of Europe, I think that um, I I feel like there's a lot to see there. So what's what's your recommendation as, as someone who does live there? Oh, yeah. So thank you so much that you're saying such a nice words about my country. Uh, I think, yeah, we are, we are, we Polish people are quite open. So definitely <laughs> very easily you will be invited in somebody's house. So yeah, don't be afraid of Polish people. <laughs> we are open. I think in the recent 20 years, we improve our English. So I think on the most places you'll find somebody that will help you also in English. <laughs> and, and yes, I was saying before we have more, many uh, horse trails and nowadays I think one of my favorite of course because this is close to my home city Krakow is the um, uh, castle trails we call it like an eagle nest trail so there are, this is a one week trail which call, runs from Krakow to Częstochowa and it follows the trails of the old castle that was built in between 12th to 15th century which are built on the on the rocks so that's why we call them the eagle nests. So this is a very beautiful trail. And in the Mazuria uh, region, this is how we call it, 1,000 lakes region. This is also There are also very beautiful places to go. And maybe also our coast. I guess not, not many people know that the Baltic coast is really amazing. This only sound. So there's like a few hundred kilometers of the beaches <laughs> with the sound. Uh, it's not actually legal to ride uh, on the all beaches, but there are some um, parts and some market horse trails that you could legally do it. So, yeah, our sea is quite cold, so that may be a little. <laughs> <laughs> 
discouragement, but yeah, the, the, but it's beautiful. Yeah, it's really beautiful. So I think Masuria, the lakes and the Jura, so the region with the with the castles are are my horror recommendation, of course for the horse people. <laughs> yeah. So. But also like, mm-hmm. uh, so you were working in Poland, and then suddenly you have this you know, things change, Poland joins the EU, and you're able to go to Denmark and to London. What was it like when you started working abroad? I mean, was it just total culture shock for you? Or was it just really exciting? Uh, I was super excited to be there, actually, because some of my this is going to Denmark, which is the first one. My very good friend, she she moved uh, away before that to Ireland. But then she said, OK, so if you look, go to Denmark, I will go to, with you. So we actually <laughs> went from different direction and we, we meet in Denmark. That was super cool. I was a little nervous in the beginning because my English was a disaster. Like in our uh, schools, they learn us English, but they not really learn us how to speak. So I was like so ashamed to even say one sentence to my boss. <laughs> that was difficult. <laughs> but after this, this few weeks, uh, I really improved. So that's also... Uh, very great experience and I also we go for the big shows uh, and that was really cool so uh, and I could ride the the sport horses as much as I want every day so that was really wow and that was really amazing to me uh, London was a little different because we don't really work with the sport horses we are grooming the horses for the for the people that the, in some livery so we're taking care about the horses so it was not so much riding yeah, but I I figure out there's also so many horse different activities in that time of my life that there's also so different things you could do. And in the very end, when I'm now on that point of my life, when I am now, I think that the trials, uh, the riding, you know, in the wilderness, it is the thing what I like the most, and I really think it is one of the most natural and the, the best thing also for the horses to do. Uh, I also think that the horses which are living, living outside, that kind of thing, they are, they are the happiest horses I am seeing all around. And, so, so when did yeah, you yeah. Um, did you move back to Poland at some point? Yeah, so I finished my study and I was, after my university degree, I am biotechnologist, by the way, I, I started to work full time in Poland. Not uh, with horses. Yeah, with horses, actually, with okay. horses, like giving some lessons and also helping breaking in some young horses, working with mm, and with some difficult horses, because in that point of the our like, in Poland, the people start to have a horses, not only not only people that doing a sport, but also private people just for fun. And, you know, very often that the, the beginners uh, doesn't buy the, the best horses for them so people have uh, problems so I, I was helping uh, people with the like say they have some problems with the horses and I was doing that for two three years and I, I, I was seeing that I'm not really developing um, and that is also I, I don't have enough money for example to go for a sport career so and that was actually the only path I was seeing that the people really could you know develop on that way so and there was some opportunity that I would start to work in my job, which is um, connected with the pharmaceutical industry. And I started, so in 2000, I think, and 10, I started to work uh, in the pharma industry. And in some point, I completely go to work in that full time and I quit working with the horses I was doing only for pleasure. And yeah, so this was also one of my uh, point of my life that that was really changing everything. But I, after a few years, I figure out that I'm not really, really, really happy with that, what I'm doing. That, you know, staying in the corporation job, uh, nine to five, and, you know, all the time with the laptops, teleconferences, emails, it is not really my word. And I quit, in, uh, and I quit in 2015. And actually, I also say, would like to say about one person that really like pushed me to do it. I was going to say, yes, your friend from the article. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us about her. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, that was actually an, another friend. Uh, ah. Because that the story about when I go to Argentina was uh, in 2018. But when I first quit, this is actually a, quite a sad story. Because my, my very good friend from my classroom from the high school, Agatha, um, I when in 2014 she get know that she has very serious cancer 
this was nearly four, five years ago now, and and she passed away this summer in in May, so she's not anymore with us. And in that point of my life, I, I you know figure out there's that we probably have only this one chance, this one life to do the thing you like. And actually, when she gets sick, she also she changed a lot, and she was also like pushing all of us her friends you know you need to do what you, you what you what you like what you need what's like what is driving you so um that was like a quite a strong shock in my life <laughs> you know that somebody which is on your age quite a young person she gets really seriously sick and you know that was like um and she know that and she, she was knowing that probably in a few years that she would be not anymore with us wow it's a very uh, intense experience definitely yeah, and I th- I remember myself when I get to know about it. I was actually in some business trip in Barcelona, and I think her mother called us, and it was like, wow, like everything is collapsing. And I think just a few weeks ago, after this information, I was thinking, yeah, okay, I I need to look for something, what I like, what I what I would like to do. And so a few months few months later, I quit my job and I like start to traveling. And then when it come when <laughs> on the board came my 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 fluffy seal, <laughs> it's, it's coming with my nickname because uh, <laughs> some friends call me seal. <laughs> I think it's childish, but I don't really like taking photo of myself. So, so I you have a stuffed animal. Pho- <laughs> yes, <laughs> I start to take a photo of it. And you know that's just just for kind of dog. And so I didn't work for nearly one year. And this was this year, first time I go to Argentina and to visit my friend. And first time riding in, in Corrientes then on some instance. And I said, oh, wow, this is the country with a lot, a lot of horses. <laughs> and uh, yeah, then I came back to to work for one year. We moved to Scotland with my with my partner, and I was working there again with my fire mine industry, collecting some money for more travel. And after one year, I quit again. And there was also a tribute to another girl, which is named Julia, and she pushed me. You need to try to travel by yourself alone because I've never done that before. And she's like, yeah, yeah, I need to do it. <laughs> and I tried. I go to Vietnam. Uh, I bought a b- motorcycle and I drive from south to north uh, all by myself. And this was also, wow, that was also like one of the points of my life when I uh, when I figured out that something could really change very differently. And I was really enjoying that because I'm a super social person. I was mm. super afraid to be by my own. Yeah, so you had the, the top gear experience. experience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is my first time that, you know, pack myself and, you know, be only by my own, be responsible and only to, you know, to make your own choices to not be dependent and also not be responsible for anybody else. So that was also quite, quite an experience for me. And how long did that, tri- how, how long did that take? You uh, to that, drive was not, the... that, that was four weeks only. Okay. But it was super Life intense changing. for me anyway. Yeah. Life changing. And I, then I came back to Poland again, spent, uh, we come back to our home city, Krakow. And I was working again in my, my, my pharma industry. And I think one year after, that was the call from Carolina, actually, that, yeah, she, she was also that kind of the group of the people that we know each other from Nila Pizza, what I was saying at the beginning. So I think she, we, I know her the, lo- the longest from all my friends because we know each other when she was, she was eight. <laughs> she was super small and I really don't like her <laughs> because we like really fighting about the same, the same uh, horse. Uh, <laughs> it was really not worth that. But anyway, so she calls me. Yeah, I'm I'm in Patagonia in Ushuaia in Tierra del Fuego, and you know I'm I'm living to to have my uh, trip to Antarctica. And so maybe you'd like to come and because there's some horses, you could, you know, go with the clients for the, for the tours and you, you like it. So uh, I, I think I was going there for four weeks and in the very end, I, I was staying five months. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, uh, I really, really fell in love in that country. I, did you ever been in Argentina? I have not. No, I've been saving it, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> So uh, I think whole South America is so different from Europe. But uh, are you from Europe? But I always think that you're from US. I am. I am from California. 
yeah that was why i was sure that it's like so for you that if the idea of big space is something familiar but for us european it's yeah. something like wow <laughs> yeah no definitely i i definitely noticed that um i mean my husband is german and he hasn't seen america yet like the united states and i just keep explaining mm -hmm. to a lot of europeans like you, you don't understand what wide open spaces are <laughs> so yeah i i do understand the so when we we went to brazil this year and he was blown uh -huh. away by it by just it was just miles and miles and miles of like grass and land and I was like, yeah, this looks like California. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, but, I mean, he was he was blown away by it. So yeah, I, I definitely know what you mean. I mean, from the reverse effect, but yes. <laughs> so yeah, I, I exactly understand your husband because that happens to me first time in 2015. And I said, wow, the world is big. And we in Europe, we are so crowded, you know. Uh, it's so difficult to write even it for some because everything is private or it's forbidden. There's so many rules. And, and roads going, and, yeah. <laughs> yeah, going to Argentina and realizing that you know, there are horses everywhere. They're going everywhere they want. The, the you know the teenagers they're having the horses like we have in your own bicycles. So everybody <laughs> have one or two. They going to the you know soccer field on the horses or gathering for a beer on the horses. So they said, oh my God, this is amazing. <laughs> right. And uh, I, I've been in Brazil. I think the Brazilians are the most open people of the world <laughs> but Argentinians are quite similar in that so they're so open all the time smiling you know and you know not looking for any trouble so yeah I feel I was just feeling great for me it was like you know healing from working in the corporate world is completely different everybody are smiling uh, it's it's beautiful landscape beautiful um, beautiful places I know that Argentina is struggling with many problems, like economic problems, uh, but still, like for me, uh, the atmosphere of being there is amazing. So I spent there nearly five months, and when I was leaving, uh, I was quite sure I'm coming back. <laughs> so yeah, this actually happened. So, and and uh, had you can... so when you uh, went there, did you have a round trip flight and what just not show up for your flight home? Uh, or what what no, made you I... decide? <laughs> Uh, I actually I buy both side ticket because uh, in that point you, you couldn't buy one way ticket from you could but it was like three times more expensive than the one way ticket uh, two way ticket was all the way around so one way ticket were three times more expensive than you know return ones so but I was sure that I will not show up <laughs> anyway so and did you have family or boyfriend or something at home waiting for you and you just kind of called them and said yeah I'm not coming what yeah was... I, to, to be honest for all my travels and this is the most difficult thing because I have my partner Nicholas uh he's we are together 10 years and it is i think most difficult thing to you know how to figure out to to travel and not ruin your relation so so I what was that say... what was that conversation like you called <laughs> nicholas and said um i know it's going to be here for five weeks darling um but actually it's going to be five months so i'll send you a letter <laughs> I... <laughs> no if you're not not so so dense it was gradually because first of all i said okay i probably will be two months uh and then maybe that then maybe they my mother said that she's coming so i said oh maybe we could stay longer and i think that's weeks after weeks and then there was this opportunity to go with karina my best friend uh, to some yacht trip from from uh, from I think Ecuador to Panama. It doesn't work. It didn't work in the very end. But anyway, that that was some idea. I said, oh, you know, this is such a great occasion. And okay, Nico was patient enough to say, okay, I I know that it's keeping you happy, and you are sometimes really unhappy, you know, working here in Poland. So all right. Okay, <laughs> he's still with me, so I think yeah, it you, you might have a lot of ladies very jealous from you right now <laughs> that that your boyfriend was so cool with with all that. <laughs> uh, you know, it's all it's so difficult to actually, you know, 
to find a good way how to do it. It's it's for me it's the biggest it's the biggest struggle I think regarding traveling because I want so much to be in so many places and I I think I just started to figure out how many amazing places there are all around the world and I have so many plans, so many dreams and it's not so easy to to figure that out but actually the second time when i went in argentina because i spent there also last uh winter so nico came with me and on the same place that i was writing the article the peninsula mitra we spent together nearly three weeks working as a part of the project of the conservation of the of the shelters that are there so yeah he he was brave enough to go with me he's not even so much about the horses like me but he's a rider as well so we spent this amazing time there riding in complete wildness together and that was wow one of the best time of my life yeah so let's let's talk about the end of the world because that was the article that you sent um (laughs) and it was an amazing article and it really I think you did a great job. I mean, the photos are beautiful and the, I don't know, just the atmosphere of it. It just sounds like there's nowhere else like it on Earth. So let, let's talk about that a little bit. Like, what, <laughs> where is Ushash, Ushasha? How do you pronounce it? I don't know. But where, where is it? And like, how, right. how do you get there? Okay, <laughs> okay so, um, yeah, this is also my favorite topic. So <laughs> I could keep Keep going, good, keep going. So we are telling, talking about Tierra del Fuego in general. Tierra del Fuego is the island that belongs partly to Argentina, partly to Chile. And Ushuaia is the most southern city of the world. Uh, there is some discussion between Argentina and Chile about it, but you can, let's leave it, okay? Let's <laughs> think that the city... There's quite a few discussions Ushuaia. like that in South America, I noticed. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. So let's say that for now, the Ushuaia, if you think about the city, this is the most austral city of the world. Also, the whole all tours to Antarctica are start there because this is the closest, the closest point. So in Ushuaia, there is uh, only one place when you could ride the horses. Uh, it's called Centro Ipico Fin del Mundo. Uh, it is like a horse riding center in the end of the world. <laughs> it's exactly translating the name. <laughs> and this is like family business run by Inbert's family, which became my very, very good friends during the time when I was living with them. And due to the kindness, I was, I was lucky enough to visit a few times uh, Peninsula Mitre, when they are like taking care about all the estancia there. So Peninsula Mitre is the most eastern part of the Tierra del Fuego island. And if you, if you think about whole island, there are actually three cities in the whole island and nothing more, and only like two roads. So this is like completely like for us European, there's nothing there. The, there's hardly no people. And that part, uh, what I was saying, the Peninsula Mitra, it's really completely unpopulated. So there were some estancias there, uh, which were started in the beginning of the 19th century by the Spanish immigrants. And and that point of and that moment in whole Tierra del Fuego, they are breeding the sheep. So and so there were sheep farms, very similar actually to the English and Scottish sheep farms. Actually, many, you know, specialists about uh, shipping, about the ships, they go, they were hired by uh, by the people that were running estancias. So this is also how the border collies, which are super popular in Argentina, they also how they came up. They came with the with the people from United Kingdom. So they started this estancia and it. It was working for nearly 50 years, but there was some crisis on the wool market and the, the prices go really down and there was also some diseases of animals. So they are not breeding uh, sheep so much in Tierra del Fuego anymore. There are still some sheep farms, but not so much as, as it was before. And this estancia was so remote that they actually, you know, abandoned it completely. So the family, the, the, the owners were not living there. And so the, only the workers, the, the few of them, they stay in the, in the shelters. But actually, I think two years ago, the last of them, 
uh, he just moved away and he is now living in the city because it was just you know the age was and it's too difficult place to live because uh this place is completely remote there's no roads and if you would like to go there you need to cross a few rivers they could be cross only on the horseback because they're quite dangerous they're, they're close to the to the coast so they're very strong currents and there were already few accidents in the past that some gauchos lost their life when passing so this is quite a quite a difficult difficult place to to transport everything you, you could only travel when the uh, the tide is low so there is no there, there is no high water in the in the rivers and then you could travel on the on the land so is that because, how you got uh, to the island uh once again so you um you said that nobody's living on the island right no no not really on the island on the peninsula on the peninsula no, on the island yeah, so on the Tierra del Fuego, it's quite huge. I just need to figure out how huge it is, but I would say like maybe one for the ship in Poland. So it, it is quite a quite a territory. But the peninsula, it is it is nowadays there's nobody living there. Hmm. You could you will pass a few estancias on the road there, but then when the first uh, river starts, there 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 were no there's no villages, nothing like this. Nowadays, actually, there are some young generation of gauchos which they're trying to restore work in the estancia, but they work more with the horses and with the cattle, uh, not with the ships anymore. But there's a, like a chance that you will meet only like few people <laughs> when you just cross the river and there will be nobody else. There's just wilderness. So you have to ride with the timings of the tide. So tell us a little bit about exactly. your, your ride. Yeah, so what we do always before the ride, you need to download the, the tables of the tides. And usually you have uh, one good tide to to go. So you need to like be really careful and look uh, how to travel because the shelters are set up more or less one uh, day of horse riding, like 35, 40 kilometers uh, distance. So you need to also know what is what is the, what are the hours because they're really changeable. So first of all, we we are transporting the horses on the on the track from Ushuaia uh, to the last estancia on the road, which is called Maria Luisa. So this is last estancia that is working there. And after that, it's this first Rio Rio Irijogen, and after that river. Uh, you this this like actual peninsula like geographically it starts, so from that point you tra you transport everything on the on the horseback. So especially when we're doing this project of of preservation of shelter last year, so we need to bring all the materials on the horseback. So like yeah you know, something to, to paint uh, the walls, uh, some shovel. We have a saw chain. And that kind of stuff that everything's go with us on the horses. That was quite a challenge, actually. So did you have some extra horses with all the gear? Or... Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, uh, you need to have a cargo horses. So on that point, we're free riders to us. So me, my partner, and one of the gauchos from there. So we, and we have free pack horses with us that will, I will tearing care, taking care of all of this equipment and also food for us. Because there is also no food, you could. Eat. There is some wild cows, so the gauchos are also, you know, gathering that cows and and killing some animals for meat. But except that, no, there is no food. And also, you need to think this is really not the very easiest climate because it is not like a sunny Argentina on the north. This is the very end of the Patagonia, and the weather could be very variable. So, like I think, north of the Scotland, you could compare to that. So, you could even sometimes have a snow in the summer, very short <laughs> fall, but there, there, the snow is possible. And in general, it's not very warm. It's like between 10, 15 degrees, and it could be super windy. Mm -hmm. And and you said so. You're timing it with the tides, and you have to go 30 or 40 k. And do some conservation along the way. What happens if you guess wrong? Uh, the tides, or what? Where do you go after the thirty k? Is there a, a safe <laughs> spot where you can hide and wait for the next tide, or how, do, how does that no, work? Uh, so actually, it's like we are not guessing the tides. So there are like a tables you could download them from the internet. They are like officially published by some institution. 
So you are not need to guess, <laughs> fortunately. <Okay. laughs> and so yeah, we so we know the safe way how to travel there. And I was saying, so the shelters are more or less like 40 kilometers away from each other. So and you have enough time uh, to travel safely and very con- convenient, because above on the above the the beach there is there are some cliffs and but a lot of them they're like a pitland so this is not very if there's a like not very wet season it, it's not so difficult but sometimes where it's very wet they could be they could be really tricky to travel mm. so it's much easier to travel on the sand and much faster also because you could you could do a lot of trotting and you are like moving much faster yeah yeah, I did actually on uh, when we went to Brazil. There's, I guess it's the longest beach in the world or something like that. I don't know exactly, uh-huh. but it was like 200 kilometers of beach. And everyone I noticed, all of the locals were actually driving their cars like it's a road because it was faster to go on the beach than it was through the town. <laughs> so that was quite <laughs> funny. So I think this is, could be a good ho- call, like a highway of Mitre. Exactly, <laughs> yes. A bit. Yeah, but beach. fortunately, there's mostly from the horses. <laughs> there are not, there are not cars there. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> uh, but it's also like the horse highway, probably the chance that you'll meet somebody is like nearly zero. Yeah. There's, there are some people that are walking around the whole peninsula because we were traveling on the horses only where the old Estancia was, Estancia Policarpo, which is the north uh, coast of the peninsula. But on the south coast, it is a completely different landscape, much more rocks uh, and much more also peatland, very difficult. So people rather not going by the horses there, but there are some people that are doing trekking. They do the trekking around the whole peninsula so starting from uh, from the last Estancia on another side, which is called Estancia Moet, and they finishing in Estancia Maria Luisa, so whole like a called like a half moon. You could, if you could, if you imagine that, it will take you one month. Oh so my. the people are doing that, that. That is quite a extreme, yeah. <laughs> and, extreme and imagine that you there is one chance that you could you know uh you could buy some food or arrange some food because in the middle so in the like uh when the peninsula is finishing there is some military base so some people arranging like that they ask the military ships that they could bring some supplies for them there so you don't need to carry the food for one month with you because this will be quite a difficult thing but yeah See, why, but still why, need to have... why would you go on foot when there's a perfectly good horse you could ride? <laughs> uh, you could, but, you know, as I'm saying, you could go on the horses only on the one coast, exactly. on the north coast, yeah. because on the south, there's too much turba, how they call it. So the pitland is just, it's the horses are just too heavy to travel there. Mm. This could be just too, too, too dangerous. So I I think I never heard about that anybody do the, the whole tour around with the horse i think it will be possible but i think it will be also very very difficult and so the, yeah no, we'd rather stay on the north uh mm-hmm. it's just much easier and also on the north you have this long long beach so we could like you know <laughs> do the favorite thing mm-hmm. on the horse <laughs> run <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> so t- tell us a little bit more about how just magical this place is like what is so special about it and what really made you fall in love with it <laughs> you know imagine that you are you know living in the city like this 2 million people around you and you know so many cars and then you just you know magically move to the place when there's nobody this is this only silence and and also, I know, so to say, there's so many signs to see that the people were trying to conquer that land. Like there was this, this all the stancias. You see the shipwrecks. There's also some. You could find some signs of the Indian tribes that were living there. There was no, no, no more, no more Indians anymore in in Tierra del Fuego. The most of them they die uh, when the contact with the white people start. So they are not not people anymore there but you could still find some you know some planters where they make it camping so you're seeing that the people were trying to live there but it's oh you know that the nature is so overwhelming you that you know you're think so small and this is so great actually that you're thinking that you know that we people are maybe not the most important uh power on that on that word uh, yeah that there's some same. some places where nature rules and like it's just not meant to have people. And I think those places are really special, definitely. 
Yeah, and you know, and imagine the land there, living some few hundreds of you know wild horses, so you could you know r- run after them. You could go just on some bay, and then on this bay you may find few thousand of sea lions colony. And it's like, wow, cool! <laughs> that was one of the most beautiful moments. So we we went with my Nico, and we were there in the moment when the when the sea lions are giving a birth to to these puppies. So it's like amazing spectacle. We just you know sit there for hours and watching from the from the cliff, and that kind of things could not. Happen. I lost you for a second. So you're saying, uh, okay, <laughs> that was this kind of things that could not happen to you, you know, every day, and you just really need to travel far to find this wildness. And it was, I feel super privileged that I was, um, I have the chance to experience that. You know, s- sleeping, uh, watching uh, the the sky, the sky, also completely different sky. It was also for me amazing thing that you know on the on the south hemisphere the stars are so different. That you are looking on the stars, even the sky is different. Everything is so so distant than from our common world that we everybody are in such a rush running have so many things to do and in that places they have only simple tasks to do you know keep going you need to find some safe place to stay safe place for you and your horses you know arrange some food and that's all everything is so simple this is like a very um, liberating thing I believe one of my best memories is like it was like nothing to do actually we were just uh, spending some nice days in one of the shelters and one of the friends so they're okay so if you want to do something you could go and find my horses so he had like a uh like 50 or something like this the big herder but they are really you know spread on the big big distances there there so i was need to ride like nearly one hour one way just to you know find a place where they are and the idea was that I was like I will I will gather them back home so to to the, the shelter when there were some corals, and I'm not <laughs> I was already doing that two times because this is how you work with the horses in Argentina so they are staying freely and you need to gather with the other horses and with the dogs but those horses were quite a difficult and and even finding them in this landscape of the of the forest and because they were above on the cliffs, which was so difficult. And after two hours of riding, I finally find the herd and it's like, wow, so cool. I'm alone and I find like 50 horses. And now my task is to bring them back home. How I'm doing <laughs> that? That was, that was quite a challenge, but I did it. So I pushed them in the very end on the uh, back again down on the on the beach and they was like galloping 50 horses in the front of me. And I was galloping after them, you know, chasing them to the home. And that was in the direction of the of the of the sun, <laughs> wow. of the sun, it was uh, one of my best memories in life. So that kind of things would not happen to you in the horse riding school in here yeah. in Europe. Right? Yeah. <laughs> no, that sounds. I mean, that is something that wouldn't happen in most places. I feel. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. And and are, I think you had mentioned. So are there some penguins as well, or? Yeah, there's a chance to meet penguins, but they're like um, single ones. So there's the colonies are not living in the in the peninsula Mitra itself. They are living on some islands which are nearby. There are a few small islands nearby. So and uh, the, there are some single ones. They are I don't know actually the reason. What is the, the biological reason why they like? You know, separating from the colony, and they you could meet them, meet them sometime on the on the beach. And they are from different species, so you could make like a king penguin. Oh, I don't know, there are another species breeds, but these funny ones with the hair like like ears, make from. The first. <laughs> I don't remember the proper name. <laughs> there is a chance to meet them, but it's not a not a common thing. Usually, there's like two or three on your way if you're doing like if you're traveling. Up to the end of the peninsula, it will take you like five days. So there is a chance you will have uh, will have a chance to see few of them. But actually, the colony, the big colony, is on the Isla de Estados, which is which is the next island on the east, and few other islands which are on the on the north of uh, on the north no sorry on the south of 
of Ushuaia. Still, I think it, it takes uh, it put things into perspective, like how oh. south you must be to encounter a penguin. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's the only, I think there's no many places when you could horse riding and meet the penguins on your way. <laughs> yes, yeah, it sounds very extreme and very special. And and so tell us a little bit about these shipwrecks as well, because I know there's a lot of history behind that. Yeah, it is. So. Uh, as you know, b- before they, they built the channel in Panama, so there was only few ways how to pass from Atlantic to Pacific, actually. And it was really all around <laughs> the, the South Africa. So one of them is Magellan Straits, which is like on the north side of the island. But some of this, but also there were some some political reasons uh, that Magellan Strait was not the best uh, road, road or route for the for the ships. So they are also they were looking for other ones. So and the Channel Beagle, the Channel Beagle, which is uh, below the Ushuaia, which is actually uh, of like discovered is maybe not a good word because there was there were native people there like but the same with America, so the the, the like first European expedition with the captain Fitzroy they they found that there is a safe pass from uh, so on the north side of Tierra del Fuego by Canal Beagle so some ships which were traveling they need to you know um, navigate around the peninsula and. This is one of the most dangerous waters of the world, the Cape Horn, uh, like the Holy Grail for all sailors of the world. It's like just a few hours away from there. So th- this is the place where all the winds which are blowing from one uh, side of the continent to another, they like, you know, passing around the Andes and the the strength of the wind is super strong. So this is dangerous water. And that's probably the reason why there are so many shipwrecks all around. And many of them we could not see them because they 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 broken in the open waters. But some of them were bring to the to the shores, like like the, the, the ship you could see on my on my photos, which is Duchess of the Albany, which is the ship uh, from the end of the if I'm called, 19th century. So <clears throat> quite a quite a big one. Which is which is still laying there, and this is also quite a mystery what happened because they they also why the captain doesn't use the two anchors that's how we call it anchors just mm-hmm. to, yeah. to stop the ship. This is they they still didn't solve uh, they still didn't solve it out that mystery why why actually it it broke, but it also there is another ship uh, that there's some rumors that. That probably were crashed just to you know get insurance so there's also <laughs> kind of you know gossips or rush but you know it's so difficult to say what is the truth and this is there was also not many people maybe die in this catastrophe for example of Tutis of Albany but it was so difficult to them to, to you know they were in completely remote place <laughs> even to you know to find some help there and in the so beginning, they survived the shipwreck not necessarily survived the the peninsula. Yeah, there was, you know, this also fascinating story uh, about, um, which is a fascinating book, which called The Uttermost Part of the World, uh, or End of the World, if I'm called, like, uh, written by Lucas Bridges, and he's telling the story about the pioneers and, you know, actually the colonization by white people of Tierra del Fuego. And there's also a very interesting story how it looks in the beginning, because the, the natives were not very friendly, I would say, uh so in some point i think even the government of argentina were were paying some prices to the natives if they help you know the the survivors to come back safely to the to the cities or to the some civilization because some of them uh were not really uh, at the beginning of the history <laughs> they're not and well very well yeah, I, I remember reading some about that because of your article, and I was thinking there was a lot of horrible things that was happening um, with the 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 Indians, and there was uh, some fighting going on, as is the history of the world, I feel. But um... yeah, I think this is the very similar story like you have in your country that is so so complicated, and you know, the people came; they also want to do a farm. There was like a natural conflict between the 
between the uh, the natives and the, the people that that came from Europe. Yeah, this is uh, this is an it's... unfortunate part of the history of of the Americas. Um, but yeah, so you know when you were doing this ride and. Uh, what what type of horses were these that you were riding? All right. So in Argentina, you have Criollo horses, how they pronounce it in Argentina. So Creole horses as well. Uh, maybe easier to pronounce. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, as probably you know, but maybe not all people that are listening to us, that there was no horses before white people came with them in both Americas. So this is quite a similar story like to your wild horses in the United States that the people were, that the Spanish and Portuguese people, they bring horses. Some of them get wild, live by themselves and then became tamed again, mostly by the Indians in the beginning. So this is like a quite of the, quite a strong breed that, that could be used uh, the f they could find the food by themselves everywhere. <laughs> they are amazing. They are quite calm. They are not very. They are not super warm blood, but they they have the spark, so they could also run and they doing the job. They are not very lazy, uh, but they they I think they are very well behaved as well. <laughs> and in Argentina, most of the horses are bred. You know, that's outside, so naturally they get they get really tough. They have strong hooves. They are very confident, even with super difficult terrain. First time in my life, I was seeing that the horses could actually climb. Like in in Peninsula Mitre, there is no there is no mountains, but in the Ushuaia nearby, there is the end of the Andes actually. So we we do for we do some tours to to the to the tops of some hills, and there's a lot of rocks, and the horses are using the hooves like a, like like we use our fingers. You know, just to put it on the edge and just to climb. I was like, "Wow!" I, I couldn't believe that. Wow. Yeah, probably you, you travel a lot, so you see how you know how the horses, which are like uh, bred in the nature, they really could do the things that we could not even think that our warm blows that they're doing the dressage <laughs> they would probably would kill definitely. each other. <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely. I was definitely riding some trails recently in, in Bhutan and in Greenland where I thought my horses would never survive this. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I'm nothing that uh, I'm so amazed by the horses. They are they are they are so so brave, so great, so calm. And like typical horse from that the Creole horse is more or less um, I uh, not so in the hands, but in in center, so it's like one and a half meter more or less. Uh, you could you could compare to the, to them to the quarter horses as well, like, because they are also like they have a lot of muscles. They are they are not really um, how we call it, not a drive. They are rather rather strong ones. I believe that you, when you go in Brazil, they are quite a similar type of the horses when you're doing mm. a marcha. Yeah, yeah, they were also um, criollo horses, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, uh, the Spanish I think pronounced them criollo. Um, but yeah, they were very, they were very incredible horses. I mean, very sturdy, very tough, like you said, strong bones, uh, and I mean, they just they have a big heart, which I, I think is what the the breed is is most famous for. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, and they mostly they using nowadays to work in, in Argentina. Are still like working horses. They work with the cattle. They work with sheep, and or also work uh, with the with the herds of the horses. And they are amazing. They are mm. very great. They super proud of them. They also uh, for Argentinians. This is part of the history, because when there was uh, independence wars with the, with the Spanish, uh, uh, being part of the army was riding that kind of horses and also San Martin, so the hero of, of Argentina, he crossed the, the Andes Ridge with his horses and this is still called the Cruz de los Andes, it is very like important um, part of the Argentina history and there is also a lot of a lot of trails that people are repeating that that tour, you know, crossing uh, crossing from one side to the other on the horses. So yeah, they are they are really tough enough to go on the four thousand meters. Mm, <laughs> wow, well, yeah. And and so what's what's next for you? Um, are you planning return trips? Do you go back 
Uh, are you back in Poland? What What's your future adventures look like? Okay, so at the moment I I'm back. I'm in Poland. Uh, I'm working again in the pharma industry. Try to collect some funds for more adventures. And so actually, I already have my ticket to 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 Argentina. But do not please do not take to my boss because they don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I'm coming that in November. So because there's like a reverse uh, season there, so the 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 spring will start in November actually. Uh, I do hope to to organize maybe some tours to Peninsula Mitre. We have that plan, and also do some tours in in Andes as well with another friend that I have in Argentina. And so this is like the, the plans for the nearest future and probably in the springtime I'll be coming back to, to Europe or at least on that to that hemisphere. I have many dreams but nothing like you know set set up yet. I would love to go to, to Iceland to work with the horses there. I was recently also doing some research about you know working in Africa because this this is amazing country. I've never been in Africa there uh, so and when I was looking for some stories and, and photos, yes, and this amazing. And also the Mongolia and Kyrgyzstan are the two destinations I would love to love to go. Mm, there's too many places, that's the problem. There's yeah, too many places. That's, that's, yeah, and <laughs> the actually, list never you know, gets shorter. <laughs> <laughs> when I when I found out your portal and you know everything and I start to read these stories, you know, I get even oh my god, it's more and more and <laughs> I realize that that people are doing that, that we girls are doing that. And as, yes, I'm, for me, I think I'm still on the beginning because most of the stories were like, wow, somebody drive <laughs> by himself for so many kilometers. I'm, I'm super impressed by that. And I would love to do something similar. I think I was thinking, I'm thinking Mongolia or Kyrgyzstan to go there, buy two free horses and to just ride. But I, I definitely would not, would like to do it by myself. I'm just <laughs> looking for some You know what? Th there's enough girls in the Equestrian <laughs> Adventuresses Facebook group that have the same idea, so I think that is very easily managed. <laughs> okay. So yeah. if any of you already listening to me, yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> I would Contact Gosha. <laughs> she companions. wants a riding buddy, and you're going to have a life-changing adventure. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, I think I was sharing with you the story about the girl that She's Italian and she's riding from Mongolia to Poland, to my home yeah. city, Krakow. Oh, and she is already in amazing. Poland. And is said, she? Yes, she's already in Poland. In two weeks, she will be in Krakow. So I'm really hope to meet her because, yeah, this is this is quite yeah. a thing. So you, uh, yeah, you need to tell her. You need to interview her. You need to talk with her. <laughs> you need to send her to us and share her story. But yeah. Uh, definitely, I was thinking that she'll be a little tired because it was like two years, but so we'll I'll give her give two days. Her some break. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but just to say that that kind of stories really amaze me and inspire me, and I, I, I think it's you know to all the people that are listening, and I think that I'm doing you know the, the things that are so amazing. This is I think just the beginning, and and everybody could do it. I like think people are looking for a lot of excuses and maybe not. Not always is the easy thing, but you know, I think everybody has some chance to follow the dreams. So, yeah, yeah, that's perfect. Let's do it. Um, yeah, just do it. Yeah, I agree. Uh, very good advice. Um, so, do is there a place where people can follow your adventures with your little stuffed animal seal and all these horsey adventures <laughs> that you're you're going on? Where where can we find you? Okay, so I'm running very super small blog on the Facebook, which is called Seal Travels. And yeah, maybe I will. I'll try to, to figure out something more horsey in the future. But at the moment, <laughs> <laughs> this is still travel. So still maybe, travels. okay. Yeah. Uh, so maybe you could take a look uh, if I share some photos. Yeah, and I invite everybody to who, who loves the horses to visit Argentina at least one in, <laughs> in his life because it is really the the great culture, the amazing stories, and the people are just so great there. So. Yes, yes, we're definitely going to join you on your on your trip the next time you go to the to the end of the world because that just sounds too amazing to miss. Um, so thank you very much. I, I hate that I have to like wrap up because it, it's been very fascinating talking to you. 
Um, and I really appreciate the advice and the stories that you shared today. Uh, I'm really honored <laughs> to be invited to that. Thank you, Crystal, so much. I'm really, really honored to, that anybody would like to listen a little bit about myself. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm going to put all of the links in the show notes where we can watch your little seal adventures and um, the link to the book that you mentioned, and then obviously the link to your article. So if anyone hasn't read it already on our on our website, then they can go in and read it. Thank you so much. You have been listening to the Equestrian Adventuresses podcast. Please subscribe to our channel and check out our website, equestrianadventuresses.com, for links to the show notes. Leave us a review and consider becoming a premium member for bonus episodes and footage. More information can be found on our website. Until next time, adventuresses, happy trails. Happy trails.